Hello everyone, I'm David, and today I wanted to show you a card game I've been developing. Uh, the cool thing is, this card game is actually a computer. Here it is, running a program. These cards at the top are program memory. That's where the program's instructions are stored. And this row of cards across the bottom, that's the data memory. That's where all the fun happens. It's where the instructions look and where the results go. The computer is running a small program I made up called ZigZag. It goes across a range of data memory, turning zeros into ones. And when it reaches a wall at the end, the number two, it goes back the other way, turning the ones back into zeros. But here's the cool thing. You can reprogram this game to perform virtually any kind of calculation just by changing out the rules that are in the program memory. For instance, instead of zigzag, here's a program that counts up in binary. It will keep counting as high as you want for as long as you play. Here's another one that counts the number of ones placed in a row here and writes that number in binary right here. The structure of the game stays the same, but there's no limit to the number of different numerical things it can be set up to do. It's a truly universal computing machine. This game is a direct adaptation of what's known as a universal Turing machine. It was first described by Alan Turing in the 1930s. He described his machine in terms of 1930s technology, switches and tape. Here's the tape. It can go back and forth, and the tape is only read in the one place right here at the playhead. And then above it all is a logical contraption that is set up to make decisions based on what it sees on the tape. Alan Turing described what the contraption did logically with a neat little diagram like this. Now this is cool. This is literally the first formalized computer programming language. His programming language is based on the machine having specific modes or states it can be in. So here is a Turing machine diagram for that zigzag program I was playing at the very start. The program has two states, numbered one and two. The machine can only be in state one or state two, just one state at a time. By default, we'll start here at state one. Now, the zigzag program also depends on the tape having a certain preset configuration of symbols on it. At the very beginning, the playhead has to start right here in the information. Now here's the astounding magical part. No matter what program you're running, a Turing machine just executes the same exact procedure over and over at the basic level. First, the Turing machine reads the symbol on the playhead. The playhead reads a zero in this case. Next, it follows the diagrams. So we're in state one. There are two different arrows going away from it. Each one is labeled. This one says, if the playhead reads a zero, then change the value to one. Okay, done. Next, the instruction says to move the playhead one step to the right. That's the letter R. Finally, follow this arrow. It loops around and comes right back to state one. So we stay in state one and the process repeats. Read the symbol, do the if then and write a new symbol, move the head, change the state. Read the symbol, do the if then and write a new symbol, move the head, change the state. This goes on and on until the playhead encounters the number two. Now what? Well, the diagram has instructions for what to do there too. This time, the number two becomes two, or really just stays the same. We then move the head left and we change the machine to the state number two. Now that we're in state number two, watch what happens. Playhead reads one, so we change that to a zero. We step left and loop back to state two. One becomes zero, move left, state two. One becomes zero, move left, state two. Until the playhead encounters the number two. Two stays two, but now we step to the right and go back to state one. We're right back where we started. We just did a complete zigzag with this program. This program is actually an infinite loop. It'll keep doing this forever, as long as you want to play. This is my original game, ZigZag, that writes the ones and zeros back and forth. So every card in this game uh, looks like this. They're actually all identical to each other. 
uh, each one has four numbers on one side, one through three, and then four through seven on the other side, so eight symbols. And you set the number that the card represents by just putting that number at the top. So for instance, this card now represents zero. Now it's a one. All the instructions are stacked up in this deck. I was very careful not to rotate them because remember, the information is stored according to which way the card's oriented. The first number for any program in my card game is zero. That way I know which side of the deck faces up. So it all starts with the deck aligned like this, zero up, and then I put down zero, that's the first card. Then comes the number of states in my program. For this program, it's two, so this program will have two states. Now, we're gonna spell out the rules for each of the states. The next number is the number one. That's state one we're talking about. The next number is two in the deck. That means there will be two rules in that state. I'll leave a space. In this card game, there are four cards per rule. This corresponds to those four steps that the Turing machine repeats over and over, remember? If this, change it to this, move the head, go to this state. So the first rule is zero, one, one, one. That means if the head reads zero, change it to one. Next, I made up the game rule that if the third card is a zero, we move the head left, and if it's a one, we move right. And finally, we end up by saying the machine is set to state number one. Second rule is two, two, zero, two. So if the head reads a two, change it to a two, move the head left and go to state two. So that was the two rules. So that's everything we need for this state. Next card is two for state number two. And we're gonna lay that one out next. And the next number is two, meaning this state also has two rules. One, zero, zero, two, and two, two, one, one. So the first rule says, if the playhead reads one, then change it to a zero, then move the playhead left and stay in state two. And then this one means if the head reads two, leave it a two, move the head to the right and go to state one. So I know laying out the cards that that is both states now. All laid out, see? Two states in this game, states one and two. I put down the next card and it's a two. This card is the initializer for the tape. And I'll show you what that means in a second. Now it's time to lay out the tape. Again, being careful not to rotate anything. Time to initialize. Okay, now we start in state one. So I'll bump that card out. All right, now we're in state one. The head initializer is the number two. So now I'll go to the second card on the tape. I'll just bump the card up. That is the card being actively read by the playhead. We just set the playhead position. We only worry about what is on the card that is bumped up. First, I'll read the head. I read number zero. In state one, I look for that rule beginning with zero. Oh, here it is. Okay, if we read zero, change it to a one, then move the playhead to the right and stay in state number one. And here we are again. The head reads zero and we're in state one. So we make it a one, move to the right and stay in state one. Now the tape reads number two. Well, we use the other rule in the state number one, which says that two will stay two, but now we move a step to the left and we go to state two. There we go. State two is now active. Now the playhead reads number one, but we're in state two. So if we read a one, change it to a zero, move left and stay in state two. The playhead reads number one. If we read a one, change it to zero, move to the left, stay in state two.
move to the right. And here we are again, back where we started, and I'm in state one. This arrangement of cards and this Turing machine diagram are logically equivalent. My only innovation here was to come up with some fixed rules for laying out the states and the rules from the top of the deck. All those little setup rules are essentially the machine language you have to know as a person when you go to set up the game. For instance, here's a slightly more complicated turn game. This program will add two binary numbers, here and here, with a separator between them, right here. They can be any two binary numbers. For this example, we're adding 101, which is the number 5, and 11, which is the number 3. So again, 5 plus 3 equals 8. So we're looking to see if this game generates the number 8. And in binary, that translates to 1000. So, We'll go ahead and run it. It proceeds until it ends up in state seven, which is the accept state. This is where it halts. And then when we check along the bottom, we find here, look, one, zero, zero, zero. That's a successful add of 101 and 11. All the programs in this game are actually like this. They first get loaded onto your table according to the machine language of the gameplay. And then they execute the rules from that data down here in the data memory. And that's it. Now I wonder if I haven't actually just created the world's most boring game. I mean, it doesn't really need you to play it. It's just kind of using you for your hands to carry out a set of predetermined rules. Really though, isn't that the point of a computer? Computers are really so successful at what they do because it takes human thought completely out of the equation. Philosophically, computers really bridged an important gap between abstract, pure math and the real world. And it brought our entire planet into the information age in doing so. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I had a great time making it. Stay tuned for my next video and I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.